ring spots, fruit discoloration, and, and not only just yield loss, but, but um, sometimes quality loss of the fruit. Uh, the biology, the virus has a huge host range, and that's important in, in the survival and, and eventually the transmission of the virus. Uh, it, and it's transmitted by the insect uh, thrips. Uh, we'll talk about those in more detail. Uh, th and th the thrips also have a huge host range. So the virus has a huge host range and the thrips have a huge host range, which means it's possible for uh, the, this virus to get around in a lot of different ways. The thrips, fortunately for us, don't overwinter in the Midwest, but they may overwinter in greenhouses. And this next point is, is perhaps the most important point that I want to get across today. The thrips may be brought into greenhouses via flower plugs and other ornamentals. So that is, if, if you grow flower plugs, uh, and not seeds, but flower plugs and tomatoes in the same greenhouse, then it's possible that, that you may uh, get the virus to be transmitted from the flower plugs to your, um, to your tomatoes. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, managing that. There's another virus, kind of a, uh, a cousin virus, and patients necrotic spot virus, or INSV, that you may hear about, has a similar biology. Uh, it, it, it's, it appears to me that like tomato spotted wilt virus is more common, but you may see uh, the, the term, the, the name in patients necrotic spot virus, or, or, or INSV as well. So here is a, a table of partial host range of tomato spotted wilt virus and you see the ornamentals up on top lots of different uh, flowers involved flowers that that you might be growing in your greenhouse anything from an aster or a begonia to a petunia or, or a zinnia uh, and so if you so that that huge host range makes it more possible for the virus to survive and then be transmitted to your tomatoes for example and vegetables there's many few vegetables the solanaceous like eggplant and pepper and tomato and we don't grow peanuts up here but in the southeast peanuts are, are uh, affected uh, very very much in, in, the, in the field as well uh, very a lot of weeds a lot of weed hosts so um, if, if you can keep your your greenhouse free of weeds and the area right surrounding your greenhouse full uh, free of weeds that's going to help I am a big proponent of landscape cloth in the greenhouse and then a, a kind of a gravel area outside the greenhouse where you can keep uh, weeds down or, or, or completely absent. So this is a, a flower. I always call it a greenhouse. They're growing bedding plants, including tomatoes. This is one of the flowers that, that they let me have. And, and it's full. It, the flower, you can tell, is just full of thrips. It's being eaten. Um, and, and, and so uh, once you have this in your greenhouse, whether it's full of bedding plants or tomatoes, it, it, it can be a challenge to get rid of them. And of course, the thrips then can harbor the, the virus and transmit it. This is a begonia with that sister virus we talked about, INSV. And the symptom, again, seems to be that advancing wave uh, symptom. Seems to almost seems like the virus is advancing through the leaf. So to manage the virus, uh, avoid growing tomatoes with flowers, uh, flower plugs for example. So the risk is greatest with transplants. So if you have one bench and you're seeding uh, tomatoes and then the next bench you have bring in uh, flower plugs, that's the greatest risk. Uh, but the, the older the, and more mature the tomatoes are when flowers are, are brought into contact, the less risk. So for example, if you uh, plant your tomatoes in high tunnel and, and you also at the same time have the the hanging basket in there, that, that's a risk, not as much as growing them uh, side by side with the chance plants, but that's a risk. If you bring the, the, um, the, the hanging baskets in when the uh, uh, tomatoes are starting to flower, then that's even less risk. But what I want to point out is that growing flower plugs and tomatoes side by side is, is a risk for tomato spotted wilt. Uh, because the, the thrips and uh, may transmit the virus from the flower plugs to the, the tomatoes if, if the flower plugs happen to be infected. So if you're growing transplants, inspect the transplants both for thrips and, and, and the virus. There are diagnostic strips available for the virus. I don't suggest that you necessarily have to buy them, but I have them 
the diagnostic clinic on campus has them. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, so so uh, I'd encourage you to, to, if you have questions, to get those uh, diagnosed officially. Um, manage weed in the greenhouse. We talked about, we'll talk about monitoring for thrips in a moment here. Managing thrips. And again, I, Laura's not here, but, but she can certainly help you with that. Destroy infected plants. If you find a plant that is infected, uh, know that almost certainly the plants on either side are also infected and should probably also be destroyed and taken well away from the uh, from the greenhouse. Uh, use tomato plants with resistance to tomato spotted wilt virus. I made a little. Um, I have a handout. This is a. It's, I have a handout of this. I can send you, but but I just put together a, a list of uh, some of the varieties that are resistant to tomato spotted wilt virus. I'm not suggesting that you turn all your production over to one of these varieties, but I think if you had problems in the past, I think it makes sense to try trial one of these and see how it fits in your production and see how it reacts to the virus if it, if it comes in the, in the next year. Uh, there's a, there's a, a variety in here. Uh, there's there's, there's uh, lots of different kinds. I think certainly there, there might be one that, that might fit into your production. So all, all, all I'm suggesting is just trial uh, uh, one of these varieties. Um, so this is not a great picture, not a great photograph, but it does show how big thrips are. So you see the penny here and, and, and you see the thrips and you can kind of see the color of the, of the thrips as well. They're very small and hard to see. Uh, so this is a, one of Laura's slides. The adults are very small, slender and yellow brown. These are of course magnified photos. The nymphs look like wingless adults and they have a rasping injury to the leaf surface, which we'll see in a moment, which causes discolor patches. So the, the, the thrips, even without the virus, cause damage to the tomato leaves. And you, you see the feeding right on the edge of the leaf here. I don't see any, any thrips there, but, but the, it's easier to find the telltale feeding that, to me as a non-enomologist, it's easier to find the feeding uh, damage than it is the thrips. This is much, this is thrips damage, not virus damage, just thrips damage. And this is, of course, much more severe. And the, the thrips problem here is, is, is without the virus, it's still a huge problem. Um, if you take one of these leaves and get kind of a close up, you can see the, the thrips, the rasping mouth part, they've scraped apart the leaf and they, they lick up the, the sap that comes out. And then the little spots that you see there is actually the poop or the frass. So this is very characteristic. And if you can see it with your naked eyes, fine. I, I, I carry a hand lens around with me. And, and if you see that, that poop or frass inside those, those feeding areas, then that's a pretty good sign that there has been uh, feeding by thrips on that leaf. And uh, this is Laura just put together the thrips life cycle. It says you can get a, a 30 to 45 days. Of course, that depends on the, on the, um, the temperature, uh, the warmer it is, the, 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 uh, the quicker that'll go, for example. But they feed by scraping on leaves, as, as we spoke about. They may lay eggs and leaves and flowers, which can make the, the larvae and, and then the adults hard to reach by insecticides. And they'll pupate in the soil. That, so that means they have a resting stage before they turn into an adult in the, in, in the soil. And so they'll crawl right down the, the stem of the tomato and, and pupate there, become adult, and then crawl back up the tomato. And of course, they have wings. So there is a little bit of flying that they can do uh, after they turn into adults. Uh, so the larvae acquire the virus and the adults transmit it, uh, but the virus is not transmitted from larva to adult. So the larva kind of do the, the acquiring and transmitting, and then the adults have to acquire it uh, from the plant, which, which, which they do. There's many different species, uh, but the Western, the Western flower thrip is the most common species involved here. So here's a, 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 a thrips monitoring slide Laura put together. They preferentially feed on flowers. You see the flower on the right. Uh, sometimes you can just flick that and if you have good eyes you can see the thrips crawling across the, the leaf. But if you would take that and put it like in a beaker like, like I have shown there and it's got either soapy water or a little bit of uh, rubbing alcohol in it, those thrips will come out of that flower and so that's a good way to monitor uh, the presence of the thrips, but she's also got 
on, on the left here, a sticky card. It's got some other insects on it, but you see she is a, there's a winged aphid and then there's an adult thrips there. Um, and she uh, she's pointed out. So yellow sticky cards are, are not a way to control the thrips, but a way of monitoring them. Here, Laura's put together a table of pesticides that are allowed in high tunnel or greenhouse production for the control of thrips on tomato. And there is information on the um, Midwest vegetable, vegetable Production Guide that this is taken from. So you see here the trade name, the active ingredient, the RAI, the PHI, and the Iraq or the MOA, the mode of action code. So you'll see and you'll notice that some have uh, larger 21 day PHIs, for example, and that means uh, you're going to have you can use that early in the season, but of course you won't want to use it during production. Um, the other thing that that Laura likes to point out here is to make sure and you alternate the the mode of action codes because thrips are very, very liable to to uh, become resistant to to insecticides. Uh, there's some beneficial organisms she talks about. They prey on soil the soil borne phase of the thrips, the pupae in the soil. So you use that early in the season before at, or at the first site of thrips. There's a mite beneficial organism, not, not spider mites, but a, another type of mite and a nematode. Um, and then she says some insecticides are safe to use with beneficials. So, so that's uh, another possibility. So I wanted to make the point here that um, to, uh, to, the big point here is to avoid tomato spotted wilt virus, grow tomatoes and greenhouses and separate greenhouse and grow tomatoes in a separate greenhouse from flower plugs. If you have to grow both, then what I'm suggesting here is uh, grow the, the tomatoes in one house and the, in, in the flower plugs in another house and be very careful about moving from the flower house to the tomato house. And what I would suggest is kind of doing, only doing, making your move from the, from the tomato greenhouse to the flower greenhouse and don't, don't go back to the, to the tomato greenhouse until you've washed your clothes, for example, at night. Um, and again, the, uh, the biggest risk is when transplants and flower plugs are grown side by side. And I just put here a slide of uh, the prevalence of, of a few selected tomato diseases in Indiana. And I put you know three pluses for very likely and a, and a plus for unlikely. And then, so for example, anthracnose, I see mainly in the field Bacterial spot, I, I, I've I never seen it in a greenhouse situation. So it's mean, it's, it, it's a field disease. Canker can be in greenhouses, but it's more common in the field. Early blight is, um, can be in greenhouses, but it's mainly a field disease. Uh, uh, leaf mold and gray mold are mainly greenhouse diseases. Powdery mildew is in the greenhouse, but it's, it's not real important. Septoria is almost always a field disease. White mold is more common in greenhouses and then tomato spotted wilt is, is common in greenhouses. So the, the, the diseases that are common in greenhouses, leaf mold, gray mold, and white mold are, are because uh, there's a higher humidity in those greenhouses and that's why those diseases are more common in the greenhouse. But for tomato spotted wilt, it's more common in the greenhouse uh, partly because uh, it gets shielded from rain so that so the thrips survive better, but also because um, the, the thrips may survive better in, in a greenhouse type situation than in the field, at least in the Midwest. And I think this is a, a photo that um, Winjing has uh, a, a survey about. Yes, thanks, Dan. So we learned from Dan's presentation about tomatoes spotted weird virus and strips. There's another group of pests, can parasitic nematode, especially runo nematode. And that can cause damage on tomato and many other vegetables. What you are seeing on the screen is the damage caused by runo nematode on a catalog root. The, this pest is very easy to overlook because it caused damage on the root. As the above symptom, it's very similar to nutrient deficiency and water stress. So a runo nematode is a widespread problem in vegetable production in warmer climate. But as we are increasingly using high tunnels, it may be become a problem or a more severe problem in Indiana than we originally thought. 
So here we are doing a short survey to understand your awareness of this past. Um, please answer two questions um, showing on the screen. Um, the first question is, are you aware that renal nematode can cause significant damage to vegetable crops? I'm not seeing the, the, well, the survey. Uh, um, I the survey was a. I I can see people answering that okay. we have. <laughs> oh, maybe because mine's okay. I got it. Uh, and the second question is, um, I want to know if renal nematode is a uh, damage in your visual production at your farm. We got like thirteen three thirteen five. People looks like we have a little bit more than half of people don't know this past, and uh, a, like a little bit probably like half half people know this and don't know about this past. Majority looks like um, folks um, like I think about half of the folks don't not sure if this is a problem. And half is sure and don't think this is a problem at your farm. Thanks for this feedback. Um, so based on this survey results, um, we will develop future extension programs to, um, to provide, to talk more about this past. And also we are planning to um, do the uh, field surveys to see um, if th this is really a concern in Indiana. Um, and if you are interested in finding out if your farm have this past, this rural nematode, if you are not sure um, and want to find out, please contact me or Dr. Dan Eagle. Um, oh, I, I haven't said, my, my name is Wen Jing Guan. I'm the horticulture specialist. I will leave our contact in the chat. Thank you. Thank you for help us understanding the situation. And I think we are open for questions for them of the of this presentation and other questions about disease. Any questions? I have a, a photo of the our, one of our greenhouses here, and this is an example of we have landscape cloth in the greenhouse, and then uh, gravel around the greenhouse, and that helps kind of take care of the weeds. I also have both my contact information and Laura Ingwell our uh, vegetable entomologist at, at Purdue on the screen. Um, you can put your questions in the chat box or, or asking here, or turn on your microphone asking here. Is there questions for them uh, about um, spotted virus or other? Wasteable diseases. Okay. I'm sure uh, Laura and I will be around if you have questions or if you think you have problems with tomato spotted wilt. Maybe I send you out and play. Nice and warm today. Emmy, are you? Do you have questions? What? I hear. Okay, I'm sure they will be around. So, if you if you think of some questions, you can leave them in the chat box while we come to the next presentation. Our next presentation is small scale onion production. Um, Petrus, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Mm -hmm. 
So you are share screen. You see the presentation? Yes. Well, thank you, Wenjing. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Petrus Langenhoven. I am uh, a vegetable extension specialist in the Department of Horticultural Landscape Architecture. And together with me this afternoon, um, I have Chris Adair. He's the, the farm manager at the, the Purdue Student Farm. And uh, we will be sharing some information about uh, small scale onion production with you. Um, we do realize that this is uh, many, maybe not one of the, the main crops that uh, small uh, growers uh, tend to grow. Um, but um, we feel it's a, a great part of our uh, crop rotation on the farm. And uh, it's a great crop to work with. Um, it is, however, a little bit labor intensive at times, uh, depending on what your uh, production philosophy is. And uh, so um, we will share some uh, experiences with you that we had the past uh, about three years um, of onion production. Just some things to uh, look at uh, when, uh, you know, choosing or selecting an onion variety. Um, obviously one of the main things is that uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that onions are triggered by day lengths. The physiological trigger for bulbing is determined by the, um, the number of daylight hours that we have. And here in central Indiana, we are almost like on the cusp of uh, that uh, long day intermediate uh, day length onion. So, uh, you can almost be on either side of the line. And uh, we have played around with at least one or two intermediate varieties, uh, but mostly long day varieties um, here at the student farm. But yeah, take that into account. We will not be growing short onions here. That's uh, something that's grown in the southern part of the uh, United States. So, um, but yeah, you might be able to do some intermediate ones. Uh, especially in the northern part of the state, that's where your long day onions will uh, feature a whole lot better. Okay, some other things to uh, think about is uh, bulb size, uh, shape, flavor, or storability. Obviously, onion is onion, but it uh, can be more pungent if you uh, select a specific variety. And depending on what your market is, um, you might consider um, the pungency of the, the onion. So. What uh, breeders have found in the past is that uh, your medium onion, which is about two and a quarter inches to three inches in size, um, they contain high levels of uh, soluble uh, uh, solids and they are quite pungent. They are thick and multi-layered. They've got very nice dark skin uh, with a good retention, uh, usually small necks and they, they dry down pretty quickly. Uh, your Spanish onions are more commonly grown in the Northwest. Uh, part of the country. However, they do well here in the Midwest, and most of the ones that we grow at the farm is actually uh, Spanish types. Um, they have larger uh, globe shaped, a uh, little bit less pungent, uh, but they're very well adapted to uh, summer, warmer summer weather. And then, of course, your uh, flat shaped onions, which is more uh, your sweet onions, which uh, we don't grow much up here. Um, but yeah, just to think about it, uh, when you have uh, specific sorting equipment, uh, sorting and grading equipment, um, the, the bulb shape might uh, affect the, the way that the machinery operates. Um, then, of course, you can uh, select for uh, disease resistance. Uh, Fusarium basal rot and pink rot is probably one of the more important ones. Um, you look at foliar disease uh, like botrytis, leaf blight, uh, and stem phyllium, and you you want to reduce disease, look at varieties that are very waxy and that the, the leaves are uh, very much um, upright. This is the classification according to the USDA for the different onion sizes. Um, you can read um, or get this information on um, the seed suppliers uh, uh, pages, websites as well. Um, but yeah, usually 
um, depending on what you do at your specific uh, farm, uh, you might not end up at that specific uh, bulb size. Um, we've never had colossal onions at the, the student farm, but we have planted uh, varieties that's classified as jumbo to colossal. So maybe it's just about our uh, feeding program or conditions are not really conducive to get that uh, large onion. So it's always good to play around with different varieties and see what they actually do um, at your specific location. Our soil conditions at the farm uh, for the past season, we, we took um, um, soil tests in the fall of 2020, um, had the, the samples analyzed, and this is what we came up with. pH 7.1, that's okay. I mean, um, we might uh, check that so it doesn't go up any higher. Uh, preferably, we would like it to stay in that range or a little bit lower. Organic matter is relatively uh, good. Uh, cation exchange capacity around 16.5, uh, which is also uh, great. Phosphorus, a little bit on the low side, we had to uh, improve that. And uh, also our potassium uh, levels in the soil was uh, a little bit lower. So I'm not trying to sell fertilizer or market on behalf of this uh, company, but uh, with our experience at the farm, we really found that this product, if you are interested in growing uh, an onion that's a little bit more uh, with a sustainability cap on. Uh, you want to maybe do it on an organic uh, basis, organic certified basis. This product is um, uh, OMRI listed. Um, and uh, the A24 uh, blend worked very well for us, especially, you know, obviously you have to look at what your soil test result is and adapt according to that. So you can get different NPK ratios. And if you do not need a lot of uh, phosphorus in the ground, you just need to maintain or top up a little bit. You can use something like Sustain A24, <clears throat> which has a, a low phosphorus uh, content. Um, I've got three different uh, uh, fertilizers here that I wanted to show you. And just look at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can see that it's derived from uh, uh, composted turkey litter, feather meal, sulfate, phosphorus potash and 7.2% uh, slowly available nitrogen. And this nitrogen breaks down over 12 weeks. Um, so that, that's great in that sense with our higher rainfall in this, the, the springtime um, that we can retain that uh, nitrogen in the ground. Another product is 464. We also use this with uh, great results, a uh, little bit lower uh, nitrogen content there, basically made up or derived from the same products. Uh, this 374, uh, we tried out for the first time last year. And the reason being, it's really cheap. It's uh, $20 and I just checked the numbers online. It's $20.30 for a bag, a 50 pound bag, versus that A24 is uh, almost 38 bucks uh, a bag. So if you do the calculations in the end and you, you want to see what fits in your budget, <clears throat> you might uh, select uh, either fertilizer. Um, so this uh, fertilizer only has turkey litter in it. And I still want to say that I think we found the best result uh, with the A24 at the farm. Um, the slow release uh, capability of this fertilizer is a lot less in terms of nitrogen, um, but we did manage to beef up the, the phosphorus quite a bit uh, with this one. So <clears throat> Chris. Thanks, Petrus. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about production, uh, soil prep, a lot of what goes into um, how we kind of produce our transplants and uh, put them in the ground and how we take care of them once they've uh, been planted. Um, with production of our seedlings, we uh, do uh, currently we do two different methods. The first method you see is uh, using our greenhouse space that we uh, have. Um, with production, uh, we are doing a lot of plants, so we can get about 900 plants per bed out in the field, and we'll do anywhere from 12 to 14 beds. Last year, we put in a little over 11,000 individual onion plants, so we have a lot of plants, so that does take up a lot of space. Um, with our production in the greenhouse, how we try to cut down on space is we plant multiple seeds per well in the tray, so we do three seeds per per well, um, so then we can break that up and transplant them later. Um, it really helps save space. Um, 
um, without really cutting much into uh, seedling production. Uh, in the photo currently, you can see onions uh, from two seasons ago uh, where they've kind of really elongated, really grown uh, tall and really flopped over and fallen over. Um, this uh, definitely made it much more difficult for uh, breaking them up and putting them in the soil. There was a lot of uh, leaves catching on each other, uh, really uh, tearing each other apart. So there was a bit of some issues with that that we fixed later uh, for later production. Um, in the picture that you can see now, uh, you can see really good root development of the plants. So those plugs do fill out very uh very well, very quickly. Uh, these were planted roughly second week of February, um, and we have them in the uh, in the greenhouse um, until until uh, mid late March. Um, so they do really fill out those plugs. Really uh, do get a lot of good uh, uh, root production down for them. Um, in the photo that you see now, uh, these are the onions that we produced last season. Um, so you can see that. Uh, it looks like they've been trimmed. So we went in about every week for uh, for probably six six weeks or so, and went back and trimmed them shorter every every week. Um, this really helped uh, thicken up the stems. You can see the stem stems are a bit thicker, a little bit closer to that pencil size shape that your pencil size that you want uh, for your transplants. Um, so the the trimming back of the leaves really helped beef those up a lot. Um, for soil prep in our field, uh, we do have pretty heavy soil, so we're, uh, the clay content is pretty high, so uh, prep can be pretty important, especially for the transplanting of the plants. Um, so there's a really nice sweet spot where the soil is just wet enough, uh, but not too dry, so when we run our, uh, our uh, plug or uh, our hole punch in the soil that the soil will actually compact and create a hole and not fill in. Here you can see the um, the punch for the soil. Um, it goes roughly three inches in the ground depending on that soil moisture. So you know, too much, it's too muddy, uh, too little. Those holes fill back in, and you're kind of just digging out holes. So a lot of the times, um, it does work relatively well, um, but there is uh, some. Uh, remaking of holes as you go to transplant each individual plant. Um, but overall, it makes it very, very nice and quick. Uh, the spacing on this is uh, eight inches uh, between the rows and four inches in inside rows. So uh, that, again, gets us about 900 plants per 100 foot bed out in the field for us. Um, here you can see us planting uh, uh, transplants uh, last season with uh, our small farms experience class. Uh, so what, what they're doing at the table is they're pulling out the plugs, uh, they're breaking those plugs up uh, and then separating the plants from each other. And then they're being uh, piled up and then taken out into the field and transplanted. Um, we found that uh, the, the seedlings themselves can kind of take a bit of a beating and uh, be pretty okay. So, um, you know, there, we haven't had a lot of issues with killing plants in the process of breaking up plugs and separating them, getting them in the field. Um, this was roughly about a week and a half, two weeks after we had uh, planted the onions. So uh, the ones from the greenhouse, uh, so the first production method takes, a, uh, they have a little bit more uh, of a hard time once you transplant them in the field, um, but they do uh, really settle in quite well um, and, and grow pretty quickly once they're in the ground and established. Um, this is another time frame afterwards. Um, as you can see, they're uh, much bigger, uh, much sturdier, really growing well, really growing quickly. Um, and we do have some overhead irrigation system out in the field that you can see there. I'll talk about it a little bit um, later. Um, but as the season progresses, they really fill out, um, really fills out the beds. Uh, there is a lot of weeding that has to take place. You can see in the uh, plots that there's some uh, areas where there's some really dense growth in the middle, a little bit lighter green. Um, that is uh, some work with uh, Stephen Myers uh, doing some uh, weed trials uh, using different herbicides and uh, comparisons to hand pulling and uh, mechanical weeding uh, with hose and stuff like that. Um, so this is the second production uh, method that we've been trying out. And um, in 
probably reality slowly moving towards uh, once we kind of get comfortable enough with it. So uh, we, we're doing it again this season, but uh, you can see there are four rows uh, very tightly packed in a high tunnel. Um, so we've, we plant these direct seeded into the high tunnel uh, with a heating cable about three to four inches in, uh, in the soil below them. Um, we'll plant them. Last season, we did it middle of February. It was too late in the, uh, too late. So they were a little bit behind our greenhouse production. So we moved that up this season to, uh, we put them in the ground about a week and a half ago. Um, and they have just begun germinating. So these, uh, it's allowing us to kind of uh, help with our space production in the greenhouse specifically. Uh, as you can see in this photo, it does a good job of producing really nice looking transplants. We were extremely happy last year with the size and the consistency of them. Um, and then they did a lot better on transplants. So they may have had transplant stress for two to three days. Uh, and that was about it. They really pulled out quickly, really got established uh, very quickly, especially compared to our greenhouse produced onions. Um, and we have had a lot of, a lot of good luck with it so far. Um, as you can see here, uh, our overhead irrigation is running. So, uh, this is a pretty straightforward and simple system that, uh, we, we purchased that's really cheap. Um, it's basically plastic tubing that runs through the field connects to, uh, some overhead wobblehead irrigation. Uh, the nice thing about this is it's very adjustable. Um, it's very cheap um, and easily uh, fixable if there are problems that you run into. Um, there's a lot of uh, nozzle, different size nozzles, different size uh, spinners that you can get as well. So if you need to cover a smaller area or even cover a bit larger area, you can do that off of um, relatively low pressures in the system. Um, so it is very important with those systems, though, to uh, make sure you take into account uh, wind, uh, because we did only initially buy uh, four for each row. We had to increase to uh, five spinners per row uh, just so we can make sure we got that coverage good for us in watering. Okay, so these are the varieties that we've uh, tested or demonstrated last year. It wasn't uh, really done in a replicated manner. It was just one bed. Uh, 100 foot bed of each variety that we put in and uh, you can see all of them are basically long day varieties except for this Hamilton uh, which is an in intermediate day onion uh, blush was interesting for us because it's a it's a pink onion it's not a full red onion um, and uh, some of these other varieties are actually related uh, as related uh, genetics um, in this case anyway you can see the Days to maturity from uh, transplanting uh, vary quite a bit, but they all more or less uh, 100 to 120 uh, days after that. So uh, we usually plant by mid-April and then uh, by mid-August, we, we should be having the onions out of the field. These are the varieties. Um, just a couple of pictures of the different ones we had. And you can see this. The, the bulb scales doesn't look that nice. Um, we had so much rain in uh, the latter part of uh, July, early August, and that really affected uh, quality in that sense. Although, you know, as you store the onions a little bit, cure them for a, a couple of weeks to three, four weeks, uh, those outer scales do come off and it does reveal a much uh, nicer picture. Um, but I tried to uh, show you what the variability of the um, the bulb sizes were in the different uh, uh, lots. Um, Gunnison, Venetia, and, and Yukon. On this slide, we are very uh, happy with the way Venetia uh, performed. Uh, there's Patterson, there's the, the blush variety. Unfortunately, this variety had a lot of uh, onion around in the field already. We couldn't even pull the bulb out. Um, because it was uh, rotted. So last uh, or the previous season, 2020, it was a, a very good performer, but it was a totally different growing season. Um, and it just didn't uh, do it for us in the, the 21 uh, season. Looking at some of the yields, um, ranked from the best to the, the worst, 
Um, we are really satisfied with these two. We've tried these two varieties now for two years in a row, and every year they have performed uh, very well. Um, I have extrapolated the, the 100 foot bed to a, a pound per acre yield. Um, so having it between uh, 75 and 82,000 pounds to the acre, I, I think that's pretty solid yield. If you break it down to on a bed basis, uh, you're looking at almost uh, 380 pounds to the, to the bed for Venetia and Hamilton about 350 pounds to the bed. And you can see where Blush uh, fell off the, the wagon here with all that uh, rotted onions that we uh, saw with that variety. Just looking at what the average bulb weight was, we didn't measure bulb diameter. I mean, we, we just didn't have the time to do that. But here's an average uh, bulb weight uh, of a sample of about 40 uh, onions of each variety. And you can really see it corresponds with uh, uh, what we had in terms of uh, yield. Um, it's more or less the same order. So the Venetian Hamilton uh, does produce a little bit of a larger onion um, than the, the Gunnison, Yukon, Patterson, Taylon, and uh, Oneida. Chris. Uh, harvest for us uh, is relatively straightforward. Um, we will harvest uh, fresh onions kind of as, as the season progresses, um, but when it gets towards the end of the season, uh, we will uh, do some wholesale harvesting and pull everything out of the field. Generally, we, we like to really pay close attention to how the onions are doing, um, try and get as much of that late production out of them as possible size-wise. Um, but once you know they start flopping over and falling over, it's really time to start looking at pulling them out of the field. Um, we did kind of have some issues this past season where right when it was time to start pulling them out of the field, we got tons and tons of rain. Um, not that we ha didn't have tons and tons of rain prior to the, that time frame, but just a really bad season for uh, right at the end of onion production for us. So just a little bit too much wet, but basically pull everything out of the field. We uh, throw it into bins and then we drag it into uh, our shed where um, we put them on drying tables. So these are uh, just some old repurposed uh, greenhouse tables that we've taken some old unused uh, sh shade netting that we have dragged across the top. So um, we can layer our onions uh, in generally a single layer, um, depending on how many we have. If we have to use all the table, if we run out of space, we will do a little bit more uh, deep layering, but try, we do our best to keep it to one layer as best as possible. Um, and then we run fans over and through everything. So really trying to get as much air contact to around, uh, all the onions as, as much as possible and really move that moisture out. We do this in our shed. So it is, uh, it is something to be cognizant, cognizant of that, they can be too hot. So trying to dry them down and say like a hoop house is probably not your best location as they can definitely get fried and roasted in there pretty quickly if the temperatures are too high. Um, and the direct sun can also cause issues for the onions. So putting them in a, a dry uh, shaded location that you can run fans through is, is your best option um, for drying them down because uh, too hot just can be too much of an issue. Thank you, Chris. Um, from our side, thank you very much for uh, listening to our uh, presentation. If you have any questions, you can reach us at uh, that email address or telephone number. Um, you can also use your uh, cell phone to scan that QR code and it will directly send you to an email that you can uh, uh, reach us at. Uh, do we have any questions? Thanks, um, Patrick. I think we have time for one question. Is there any questions from the audience? I see there are some in the chat. Yeah, maybe, maybe um, always you can put the real questions in the chat. And we have some questions from previous talks. Please answering them in the chat box. I'm sure Patrick and Chris will be around, so you can put your questions there and uh, they will answer it. Next, we will have two recorded posters, very interesting talks. I will play that.
Hello! My name is Katie Terrell, and this is my research on black soldier fly larvae compost and the effects it has on plant growth and field settings. Urban farmers face unique challenges when it comes to soil health, including low quality soil, high input costs, and space limitations. To combat these problems, many rely on the use of soil amendments to improve their overall soil health. This study focused on comparing black soldier fly larvae compost to a commercially available composted cow manure known as black cow. Can I don't know whose screen we are seeing at the moment, but there's no presentation. Let me try again. In the laboratory, we created black soldier fly compost from single waste streams, including food waste, plant waste, spent warts, and sheep manure, which we refer to as biosolids. We present the results of a compost analysis of each of these compost sources alongside the commercially available black cow in a pooled sample of black soldier fly compost, where we mixed all of the waste streams together. We found that the black soldier fly compost had an overall higher NPK content compared to the commercially available composted manure shown in figure one. The black soldier fly generated compost also had higher organic matter. We then applied the pooled black soldier fly compost or black cow to three different crops at the Meg's horticulture farm. While we found no impacts on yield in tomato or cucumber or above ground biomass as a result of the compost amendments, positive effects can be seen in figures two and three, which show the average dry weight below ground biomass for carrot and cucumber plants higher on those amended with black soldier fly or black cow compared to the control, which had no amendments applied. Carrots produced the largest below ground biomass including the harvested portion, when amended with black soldier fly compost. Cucumber plants performed similarly on black soldier fly compost and the commercially available black cow, both better than the control treatment, which had no soil amendments added at all. This shows that black soldier fly compost may have benefits for root development in some crops. However, in figures four and five, we can see that tomato plants performed equal to or better than no application of amendments for above and below ground biomass. This study shows potential of black soldier fly composting for vegetable production as a mechanism to reduce waste and lower input costs for small farms. I'm not sure if, um... Casey, are you here? The speaker of the poster, if we have questions. I'm not sure if we have questions from the audience about this work. If not, this is our next poster. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Christian Salinas. I'm a student at the National University of Colombia and currently a visiting scholar at Purdue University. And I'm going to present you my poster about the role of seed transmitted endophytes in quinoa tolerance to cadmium stress. First, it is important to remember that quinoa is a crop original from South America. This is becoming a very important crop because uh, first, uh, it's highly nutritional content and second, because this crop is resistant to salinity and drought that is very important for future agriculture and food security. And food security. Uh, most of quinoa around the world is produced in South America, particularly Peru and Bolivia, but some soils in Peru are polluted with cadmium and it can have an effect in health toxicity and plant stress. So this cadmium is absorbed in quinoa seeds that is the final product. 
that most of it come to the US to be uh, manufactured as other kinds of food uh, products. So for this research, uh, we want to focus on how cadmium affects microbes inside the seeds and if any of those seeds could be beneficial to create free, cad free cadmium quinoa crops. So, to understand this, it is important to know that when cadmium, when cadmium is in soil, a plant uh, absorbs these molecules through the root and just transport it uh, to other tissues such as the leaves and grains. Uh, recent, studies, recent studies have found that um, this heavy metal um, is in a high concentration in quinoa grains and quinoa grain-based uh, processed food in Peru. And obviously it could have also a uh, bad effect in um, other consumers abroad. So uh, having that into account, some studies uh, have found that uh, in, in some plants, uh, when you have different uh, generations that were exposed to cadmium in soil, uh, the seed microbiota or the microbes inside the seeds uh, can change and can be uh, more beneficial to help the plant avoid uh, the absorption of this molecule. So for this research project, what we did was uh, study two different quinoa genotypes, when we will call the genotype A and the genotype F. Uh, both of them were grown under zero and 10 um, parts per million of cadmium. And what we did was uh, first extract all the DNA that was inside those seeds, sequence it, and identify different bacteria and fungi that could be found inside the seed. In a parallel way, we, some of those microbes were capable of uh, being culture in the laboratory. So we purified them and we uh, ran some uh, biochemical tests to identify beneficial activities those microbes have to promote uh, plant uh, growth in, in, in this crop. So one of our preliminary results is that um, in general, uh, both of our genotypes of quinoa uh, had a uh, presence of bacteria inside the seeds, but only the genotype A had the presence of fungi. This is very important. Um, later, we found, on the contrary, that only uh, some microbes could be uh, isolated and cultivated in our lab. However, um, for the genotype F10, we found only one gist that could be uh, cultivated. For all those genotypes, bacteria and fungi, uh, what we did was uh, test two particular plant promotion activities. The first one, the production of indolacetic acid, that is a molecule that helps uh, promoting plant growth, and the nitrogen fixation. We know that nitrogen is a key uh, nutrient for plant growth. So what we found for the different isolates we could uh, uh, cultivate in our lab was that uh, all of them were capable of fixing nitrogen, but just one fungus was capable of producing indolacetic acid. We know that some of those uh, bacteria and fungi had already been reported in the literature uh, as plant growth promoting uh, microbes, such as the case of Bacillus bacteria, uh, Aspergillus and Cladosporium um, fungi. However, uh, some other isolates, such as Lutemonas, uh, doesn't have been reported yet as a plant grow uh, promotion uh, microbes. As some preliminary conclusions in our coming steps, uh, the first conclusion, uh, our, our, all our isolates are capable of fixing nitrogen. This is very important. Uh, second, uh, we reported the Malassezia globosa uh, as the only isolate to be uh, capable of producing indolacetic acid. This is, this is new because this uh, fungus is particularly a, a human pathogen, uh, like as a skin fungus, so most more richer research should be should be uh, done about this and for coming steps we should uh, test uh, some other uh, plant growth promotion activities that are very important such as 
uh, sidro force production, phosphate solubilization, and ACC deaminase synthesis. All of them are related with, uh, could be related with the lower uh, absorption of cadmium in quinoa crops. Thank you so much. Okay. Mm. I will leave the contact of the two speakers for our poster in the chat box. If you have questions about those posters, you can read them. And our next presentation is about cover crops. Ashley, you ready to share a screen? Looks um, Yeah, looks good. OK, great. All right. Well, thanks for joining us this afternoon ahead of this Snowmageddon event that we're apparently going to have over the next couple of days all across the state. Um, I'm going to present to you on a kind of an applied topic. So we've heard a couple of um, researchy type topics this afternoon, and this talk is a little bit more based on some of the experiences that I have had and that the Purdue Student Farm has had with cover crops over the past several years. And using some of the lessons learned there to help inform what your cover crop strategy might look like on your farm. Um, so my name is Ashley Adair. I am the Extension Organic Agriculture Specialist here in the Horticulture and Landscape Architecture Department at Purdue. Um, this talk is coming from a pretty non-beginner perspective, and it's also coming from an organic management perspective, but these practices can apply to conventional management settings. So if you are using conventional management on your farm, that doesn't mean you can't use cover crops to your advantage, and it doesn't mean you can't learn something from this presentation. So we know the whys of cover crops. So cover crops help farms mimic nature. They kind of keep the farm looking more like a prairie by having continuous soil cover. Um, Cover crops feed soil microbes. They improve soil texture and tilth. They improve drainage. They fix nitrogen. They suppress weeds. They do all kinds of good things for the farm. They can also form a clean straw cover for something like a vining crop like pumpkins. They can attract pollinators and create habitat for beneficial insects. So there's a lot of reasons my, why you might want to use cover crops. And this presentation will be a good start for you to diversify your cover crop strategy if you haven't stepped beyond some of those basic cover cropping practices that are pretty well characterized on a lot of farms out there today. When it comes to cover crops, there are a lot of different hows for implementing your cover crop strategy and trying to take stock of all of those hows can be kind of overwhelming. So you might know the basics of when and how to plant something like a cereal rye cover crop, but integrating cover crops into a vegetable farm over the long term presents a unique set of challenges. And as you are well aware, the more crops that you add to a farming system, the more challenging it becomes to plan for each year. And you will be spending some money on cover crops as well. But with cover crops, it's worth the effort and the financial investment for all the benefits that you can receive. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about some ways that you can work on optimizing that cover crop strategy as well as diversifying the strategy and try to figure out how cover crops can help you solve or mitigate some problems on the farm. So we're going to use the Purdue Student Farm for some hypothetical examples that are somewhat based in reality from experiences that um, have occurred on the farm over the past several years. So I'll just kind of guide you through what the student farm looks like. I'm sure that several of you on the webinar presentations today have visited the student farm before, but I'll just give you a brief overview of how the farm is organized and why it is the way it is. So as you can see in this aerial view, the farm is divided into distinct blocks and each one is roughly an eighth of an acre in size. So the student farm is on a six year crop rotation plan and the crop rotation includes the following. So there is a year long cover crop planting in the cover crop block. So that's from spring to summer to fall. It's a continuous cover cropping season. There's a solanaceous block that includes tomatoes and peppers and also includes a couple of caterpillar tunnels. 
There is a fall cool season crop block that includes your greens and your cabbages and your kales, that type of thing. That block is cover cropped in the spring. There's also a potatoes and corn and squash summer crop block. Then as you are aware from the previous presentation, there is a whole block devoted to alliums. So onions, garlic, and leeks are all grown at the student farm. And then there is a spring season crop block. So this is the same as the other cool season crop block, but it is cover cropped in the fall instead of in the spring. So there's high tunnels on the farm as well, as you can see in this image, they are used to produce a variety of crops. One of them is typically dedicated to tomatoes. One is dedicated to peppers. One has recently been dedicated to hemp production and another includes some unusual suspects. So some tropical crops like ginger, lemongrass and turmeric. There's also a small tunnel on the left-hand side that has been used to produce horseradish and has some other exciting plans coming down the line in the next couple of years. So that's what the student farm looks like. There's also on the bottom left, there is a wildlife area. So this is an emergent wetland that tends to fill with water or dry up depending on what the season looks like. And there's also a couple of beehives and an asparagus bed just north of that area. And there's a few fruit trees on the left-hand side, so the west end of the farm. And there's also some brambles up at the north end. So now that you have a good idea of what the student farm looks like and can keep that in mind, let's talk about some goals that you might have for cover crops on any farm that you're working on. So advanced cover cropping strategies and advanced crop rotations are going to need to revolve around some type of goal. And those goals can vary from farm to farm, but some of your goals might include any one of the following. So increasing po pollinator populations or pollination reservoirs for honeybees might be one of your goals. Improving soil prep characteristics might be a goal. So improving aggregate stability, improving uh, the tilth of the soil and water holding capacity, that type of thing. There's also the opportunity to increase the overall diversity on the farm. So the more different species that you add, the better the biodiversity on the farm. And biodiversity does correlate to resilience to things like climate conditions and extreme weather and even market volatility as the student farm has experienced throughout the pandemic. And some other goals might include smothering weeds. So this is a huge one for cover crops. Cover crops are great at being plants, and if they are planted correctly, they can be better at being plants than the weeds in some cases. So if you treat them correctly, they will often compete for resources like space and water and um, nutrients to outcompete weeds and keep overall weed populations on your farm lower than they would be otherwise, while also protecting the soil. You can also break up disease and host cycles to a certain extent. So disrupting the disease triangle. So if you take any one of those legs of the disease triangle away, whether it be the host or the pathogen or the favorable environment, you disrupt the disease. So we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the coming slides. And then of course, another pretty obvious use of cover crops is fixing nitrogen. So thinking about those legumes and their ability to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere through a symbiotic relationship with um, bacteria that colonize the roots. So lots of different purposes for cover crops and lots of different reasons why you might want to use one species over another or mix them together. So we'll start by framing some common farm problems that you might have had and then address how your cover crop strategy might address this problem. So I want to mention that these farm problems and strategies are not necessarily intended to be prescriptive, but they are intended to help spark ideas for cover crop use on your farm. So as you are aware, every farm is very different and there's different soil types, there's different vegetable and fruit markets that you might be tapping into. And there's just overall different production challenges on every farm. And they all play a role in how well any one particular strategy will work. And one thing I won't discuss as much in this presentation, as you've probably heard in lots of other cover crop presentations um, produced by folks in Extension and the Conservation Partnership and, and other folks in this space, I'm not going to talk quite so much about nutrient management with cover crops in this talk, 
There's lots of great resources and presentations out there about nutrient management on farms that use cover crops. So I want to explore some of those other cover cropping goals that you might not have thought about quite so much. So I have a couple of resource slides for you at the end of the presentation that can help you learn more and address some of those other issues that we don't discuss quite as much in this presentation. So I'll make sure to, to stop and explore those with you a little bit and direct you on how to get your hands on those resources. All right, so let's jump right into some of these hypotheticals. So first one, there's too many weeds in one part of the farm. So let's say you have a corner of the farm or maybe all of the farm, depending on where you are, where Canada thistle is your primary problem weed and it's the absolute bane of your existence. It's a nasty weed, it's a perennial, it has about 20 times more going on underground than what you see above ground. There's just a lot of things that are nasty about it in addition to the fact that it kind of hurts to interact with it physically. So it's a good idea to try to keep this one out of your farm operation if at all possible. And in addition to the other strategies that you may choose to manage Canada thistle, one of the strategies that might help you out is to plant a very dense stand of a particular cover crop usually an overwintering cover crop, something like cereal rye or a mix of cereal rye and something like crimson clover. So if you're able to get your cash crop out of the fields with plenty of time to spare, so probably three or four weeks at least, um, it's, a, it's a great idea to, you know, kind of over overdo the seeding rate a little bit on some of these cover crops to make sure that they have enough um, enough biomass to kind of crowd out all of the other stuff that might try to come up underneath it. So the higher seeding rate um, might be a little bit more expensive for you, but it will help you manage some of these kind of nasty problem weeds in a particular area of the farm. So it might, might not involve spending too much extra money, but it will um, involve spending a little bit of extra money. And we could take it a step further so if you're managing a problem weed or just a particularly weedy bed, you could take it into a continuous cover cropping strategy instead of just doing an overwintering cover crop like cereal rye or crimson clover or something like that. So continuous cover cropping is going to disturb the soil less than a cash crop. So you would also get the benefit of disturbing the soil less over time, which has plenty of its own benefits. And it would increase the competition with something like Canada thistle for more like 12 months instead of just four or five months. In this example, cereal rye can be followed by a variety of cover crops that do well in the summertime. So you'd plant your cereal rye like normal in the fall, allow it to get established and then wait until, I don't know, depending on your area, you might wait till late April or early May to terminate that cover crop and whichever method you choose, whether that's herbicides or roller crimping or something else that works well for you like flail mowing. And then you could go ahead and seed in a summer cover crop of some kind. So buckwheat is a great choice. It's also colloquially known as smother crop. So it has some obvious characteristics that make it um, good at smothering weeds, that one of them being really rapid establishment and another of them being it grows um, pretty densely and you can seed it pretty densely. Um, and you could also mix in something like cowpea. So cowpea is a heat loving legume. You could even plant that in a high tunnel if you wanted to. Um, you could seed that alone or in a mixture or pick it really a, a whole number of other summer cover crop species. You have lots of choices there and lots of room to experiment. And then you could go ahead and terminate those by the time uh, August and September rolls around and then seed in another overwintering cover crop like cereal rye. So this is not a silver bullet strategy to eliminating weeds, but it is a biomass intensive management strategy that can help reduce a weed's ability to compete over a period of time. So if you have some room on your farm to do a full season green fallow, so to speak, this might be a good option for you. So let's switch gears. Let's talk a bit about plant disease. So you may have run into a number of plant diseases um, on your farm over the, you know, the past several years. 
And sometimes they just rear their ugly heads for, you know, reasons that are unclear. And sometimes disease comes in on seeds. Sometimes it comes in on tools. Some, it, there's just all kinds of reasons that plant disease can manifest that isn't necessarily related to your climate, but sometimes is. So let's talk about xanthomonas in particular. So xanthomonas is a pathogen that can infect many different types of vegetables, but this particular campestris pathovar, uh, this is the type that infects cruciferous crops like cabbage and broccoli and turnips and radishes. And it manifests itself in some of the symptoms that you see here. So you see this kind of necrotic type of lesion that's happening toward the edge of the leaves. And it's obviously going to reduce the marketability and the quality of your stand of these types of crops. So if you've ever had it on your farm, you know that it tends to persist in the soil for a long time and even on dead plant material for an even longer time. So up to a couple of years. So cover crops are not going to cure the farm of plant disease. Don't mistake me there. But there's strategies using cover crops that you can use to mitigate the disease once it's on site. Um, so if you avoid planting cover crops that are also in the same family, in the brassica family, this can be a good step in the right direction to eliminating a particular host plant that could harbor the disease for longer than you would really want it to hang around. So there's lots of good reasons to plant cover crops and there's lots of good reasons to plant brassica cover crops in particular. But if you have a certain disease problem that favors a particular plant family as its host, like the brassicas, you can help to discontinue that disease cycle by avoiding planting certain cover crop species just for a certain period of time. So if you have more questions about that, there are plant pathologists here with us in, in the talk today, as well as we have plenty of resources here at Purdue. So if you're curious about um, certain plant families and their susceptibility to disease, don't hesitate to ask. So now let's talk about bugs. Let's say you've got bugs and most of us end up having some type of bug on the farm at some point, somewhere along the line. And a particularly common one is the cabbage butterfly. So those little green caterpillars that you find just having a heyday in, again, things like brassica cover crops. I don't want to disparage brassica cover crops, even though it seems like I am kind of calling them out for some of their susceptibilities. Uh, but avoiding the use of those brassica cover crops, once again, can help with trying to keep certain bugs away from certain other crops. So let's say you have cabbage growing in the field and you are doing a continuous cover cropping plan in another crop block on your farm. Then you might want to avoid planting something like mustard if you want to keep your cabbage butterfly population at least a little bit lower. So there's other control strategies you can use with cabbage butterflies that uh, the different types of products that are used on larvae are typically effective on cabbage butterflies. So you can use um, the cover cropping strategy of not using brassicas and not using those, the turnips and the mustards and the radishes just to kind of help mitigate the problem, not cure the problem. And now let's talk about onion thrips. So the student farm has onions and has been growing onions for a couple of years now. Um, so there's bugs that can affect these types of crops as well. So onion thrips in particular are uh, a bug that can end up attacking onions, garlic, and leeks. And they tend to congregate in parts of the leaf that are tightly wound around other parts of the leaves. So these little kind of elbow areas where there's tight space where these, these bugs like to hang out. So in addition to good sanitation practices and choosing resistant varieties of these allium crops, um, preventing them on the farm can be helped by more smart cover crop use. So in this particular case, Onion thrips can sometimes overwinter on grass cover crops. So it's a good idea to avoid planting a grass cover crop like cereal, rye, or wheat if you're going to be planting alliums in that particular area in the next year. And now here's the kind of opposite side of the coin for this situation. Um, you might find more good bugs on the farm if you're using cover crops. So this is on a more positive note here, not really a problem at all. Cover crops 
will create habitat for certain predatory insects, like insects and other arthropods, like centipedes, mites, and lace wings, which are shown in the image here. Those are little lace wing eggs on these little kind of antenna like stalks that are on some type of grass cover crop. It's been long enough since I've taken that picture that I can't remember if it was a cereal rye or if it was a wheat or triticale, but it's on a grass cover crop in the springtime. So if you're not familiar with lace wings, um, lace wing larvae are known as aphid lions. And they're such ferocious predators that not only will they eat quite a few aphids during their lifetime, but they will also even bite humans in some cases. And whether that's out of hunger, fear, or rage, I don't know. <laughs> but lace wing eggs are a good thing to find. Um, so if you are planting cover crops on your farm, there's a good chance that you'll be encountering a diverse set of different predatory insects and other arthropods that can kind of help mitigate some of the other insect and pest issues that you might see on a year to year basis. So a different type of problem, this is more of an infrastructure problem in this case. Let's say you have an empty high tunnel that you're not planning to use for a certain period of time. So in this image here, this is spinach that's growing in the high tunnel at the Purdue Student Farm. This was back from a different big snow event back in January of 2019. We got, I think about eight inches of snow that year. Um, so you're using the high tunnel for season extension as you would. Um, but you're not planning to put any uh, intensive summer crops in the high tunnel in the summertime. So what's something you could do with the high tunnel instead of letting it stay fallow? Well, one option you have is to plant cover crops in your high tunnel. So this image is actually from a high tunnel at Southwest Purdue Ag Center in, it was dated 2016. And this is a cowpea cover crop in the high tunnel. And like I said earlier, cowpeas are a heat loving legume. They're, they're the same crop that produces black eyed peas. And they tend to do well in kind of dry and harsh conditions like you might find in a high tunnel in the summertime. It tends to get pretty hot under this, this plastic during the summer. So you have options to plant certain types of cover crops in the high tunnel, as long as you're comfortable managing them with the equipment that you have. So cowpea is nice because it doesn't get super tall like a sorghum Sudan grass or something like that would. Um, other options, you might consider something that also does well in hot and dry conditions. I, I've seen teff used in high tunnels and a couple of others, but Cowpeas are nice because they'll fix nitrogen for you in addition to just taking up space and um, keeping your, your labor requirements for keeping the area weed free a little bit easier. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Wen Jing Guan because I found this, this photo um, through the vegetable crops hotline and um, this was something that Dr. Guan um, she conducted a study in Southwest, at Southwest Purdue Ag Center in 2016 that involved this cover crop. So I'm going to give a few details here and she can correct me if I'm wrong about any of the details that I gleaned from this article. Um, but the cowpea cover crop that's shown here was grown for about five weeks and then it was incorporated to provide enough time for that cover crop to decompose ahead of planting a fall cash crop. So over the time period, the cowpeas contributed about 40 pounds per acre of nitrogen. So if you want to read more about that case study, I'm sure Dr. Dr. Guan would be willing to answer your questions here, but you can also read the Vegetable Crops Hotline article that is linked in this slide set if you would like to learn more. So another type of problem, let's say you don't have enough pollinators. This is one of the most fun reasons to use cover crops, in my opinion, because you get to see such a wonderful diversity of different pollinator species visiting all of your cover crops. So maybe you also have honeybees on your farm and you want to create more opportunities for those honeybees to gather pollen. And planting cover crops in this way can create more uh, nectaries and pollen resources for our native bees like uh, bumblebees and some of our solitary bees and our mason bees and that type of thing. So these species that are shown in these next couple of slides are all known to attract pollinators. I think you can see a bumblebee in all of the photos that are on this slide. <laughs> all of these cover crops were growing at the student farm um, for each of these photos and bumblebees are just voracious pollinators that they will visit everything from hairy vetch to crimson clover to buckwheat to sunflower. So they're very busy. 
um, and they become very abundant at the student farm um, throughout the season because of all these different cover crop resources that they can visit. So some of these species are intended for cool season planting. So hairy vetch and crimson clover are technically cool season species, but crimson clover seems to do well no matter what time of year you plant it up in our area, does fine in the summer. And then buckwheat and sunflower are understandably summer cover crop species. So a couple other species that you might consider are the mustard. So I know I was disparaging these brassica cover crops earlier, but they're also great for pollinators. Um, and there's some cool adapted mustard species as well as summer adapted mustard species. Um, there's also lacy phacelia, which is one that I don't have a lot of personal experience with, but I've heard about quite a few uh, farmers in whether they're growing grain or are growing vegetables on a smaller scale. I've heard about people using lacy phacelia more and more. And then there's also sun hemp, which can be a little bit tricky to manage, but it's a kind of a fun cover crop to see growing in the field. And it's another legume that puts on quite a bit of biomass and also can be attractive to pollinators. So you have lots of different choices here. And if you're of an experimental mindset, this is a great place to kind of figure out uh, which cover crop species are going to work best for pollinators on your farm. And they also provide some aesthetic beauty for the farm. So if that's something that um, you need to take into consideration because you run a U-pick or you have an event space on your farm or something similar to that, then cover crops that add some beauty to the farm can be helpful to you as well as to pollinators in the area. So again, brassicas can be kind of tricky sometimes. So if you have, um, if you have other areas of the farm that a brassica cover crop species could negatively impact, you might consider removing that one, uh, but they're still a great choice for, for folks that are not quite as worried about plant disease and some of the insect issues that brassicas can exacerbate. So I'm gonna kind of finish up here with some equipment examples and things that you might want to be equipped with if you're gonna be managing a wide variety of cover crop species on the farm. Much of the equipment shown here is multi-purpose. So mowing equipment like the sickle bar mower and the Berta flail mower that's shown here, those types of equipment can be used for multiple other purposes around the farm, just like the cedar and something like a tine weeder. Um, can also be used for other purposes. So it's possible that you might already have some of these available and you're using them for other jobs around the farm. You can just go ahead and incorporate these types of tools into your cover crop management strategy. But if you don't have it, some of this equipment available, I'd say that one of the biggest things that you would consider investing in is high quality mowing equipment because termination through mowing is a great organic management strategy for cover crops. And flail mowers in particular do a really great job of chopping up residue finely, which will help it decompose quicker and help you turn that field or crop block around into a new crop even quicker. Um, as far as sickle bar mowers go, sickle bar mowers can be helpful if you're growing a vining crop and you need a straw-like bed to plant into. So it kind of keeps the fruits of those crops a little bit cleaner. So it leaves pretty much the entire above ground part of a cover crop intact and it doesn't chop it up like a flail mower would. So it'll kind of cut it off at the ground level and then let it lay over. So that residue will decompose a lot more slowly, but can be useful for certain purposes like growing a vining crop. So um, cover crop termination equipment like the one shown here are available both for walk behind tractors and for compact tractors and, and things that are bigger. So depending on what type of um, equipment series you have on your farm, you should be able to identify a piece of equipment that'll work best for you and hopefully not break the bank in the process. So we'll wrap up here in our last minute or so with some cover crop resources that can be helpful to you. So the Managing Cover Crops Profitably publication is available through SARE. It is a free PDF if you download it online, but you can also request a physical copy uh, for about 20 bucks from the SARE website. We also have the Midwest Cover Crops Field Guide, which is in its newly revised third edition, which was just published at the end of 2021. So that one is available at the Purdue Education Store. 
And then a couple of other SARE publications that are available as free PDF downloads include Crop Rotation on Organic Farms and Building Soils for Better Crops. Both of these are very well put together, well-written resources where you can learn more um, about cover cropping and managing your soil for a more productive farm. So those resources can be found here. And just real quick, I'll just end with, with this, with my contact information. Um, if you need to get a hold of me, I can be reached at 496-6362, and my email is listed here. So I want to thank you for your attention, and without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Wen Jing for our next presentation. Thanks, Ashley. A lot of great information about cover crops. Um, we will move forward, but I'm sure Ashley will be here, and Ashley have her contact. Um, she puts on the chat box. She also showed on our slides. So if you have questions about cover crops, you can reach out. Okay, our next next presentation is about pruning and trellising in high towers. Petrus. Thank you, Wenjing. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Next presentation, we're going to talk about trellising and pruning in high tunnels. I am Petrus Langenhoven. With me, I have uh, Wen Jing Guan and Liz Maynard. And uh, together, we are uh, vegetable extension specialists in the horticulture and landscape architecture department here at Purdue. OK, so we know that uh, high tunnels uh, is a very valuable resource uh, for a farmer. Uh, they come at a cost, however. So one way to increase output and uh, maybe profitability from this kind of growing environment is to uh, plant crops that um, you can trellis. So instead of just making use of the horizontal space in the structure, um, you can trellis your crop vertically, and therefore, um, you can increase um, the amount of produce, depending on how long you actually grow that uh, product for. And uh, I know my, my co-presenters will talk about that as the, the presentation uh, will go on. But one of the unique things about trellising is that uh, you can manipulate the crop uh, to do certain things for you. Um, we can also uh, increase airflow. Uh, we can make it easier to harvest, for instance, or we can manipulate how much uh, produce we actually have on that plant. Um, so that, those are very interesting things uh, that we will talk about during this presentation. Um, obviously, there are cost implications to uh, trellising and, and pruning. Uh, there's a, a couple of things that you need in terms of infrastructure. Uh, in your high tunnel. And probably one of the first things you need to ask is if you want to do high wire uh, trellising, is your tunnel suitable to handle that? I mean, can your tunnel handle that crop load? Is it made to uh, hang a whole bunch of uh, tomatoes on? So that's something to check with the manufacturer uh, of your structure. So following this presentation, we would like you to understand a little bit about the uh, plant biology. Uh, the uh, the plant structure that uh, 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 the structure of the plant that you are actually growing um, get some ideas about different trellising methods and understand how to determine what makes sense uh, for your operation. I'm going to talk about specialty methods first, and you would probably say, "Wow, I've never seen this kind of uh, thing happening." Um, we don't do this generally in uh, Indiana. It is done. Uh, uh, on a very large scale elsewhere in the world. And it actually prompted Wen Jing and I to, to do a project on uh, especially melon production in high tunnels. And uh, this looks all very good and well, um, but you can see there's a lot of biomass and this is a very fast growing plant and uh, this has to be managed. So some of the main objectives of, uh, uh, of trellising a, a melon is to uh, raise the fruit off the ground uh, that was our, one of the first things that we wanted to look at. And, uh, you know, if you can remember in 2012, we had this food safety scare um, where, where we had a, a, a foodborne illness outbreak um, with melons here in Indiana. And there were some fatalities involved there too. 
And we thought, you know, it would be a great idea to actually lift the fruit off the ground and actually uh, not have it in contact um, with any um, of those um, uh, pathogens that can cause uh, foodborne illness. Um, we wanted to manipulate the crop to, to provide better airflow. Uh, the leaves are gigantic. They're very big. Um, there's a lot of laterals being produced by the plant. And uh, we were aiming for about four to five fruit on the plant. So to show you in, in 2017, we, we did some tests to, to look at uh, what are the yields between, uh, the yield differences between open field, high tunnel uh, production, high tunnels where you grow in the soil or in the high tunnel setup where you have a soilless substrate. And basically with the data here, you can see um, the plants, uh, the number of plants per acre is about two and a half times lower than what they are in the, the high tunnel structure. So we can pack in a lot more uh, plants. And that was the main driver for um, the yield increase uh, in those two production systems. The fact that we could trellis them upright, create more space uh, and pack in more plants um, uh, in that structure. Okay, so this is the traditional growing method, plastic mulch, the crop grows horizontally on the ground. Uh, in this scenario, we use the Hortinova uh, trellis netting uh, to guide the plants up on. In the third scenario, you can use a, a tomato string, a tomato twine uh, in a high wire trellis system. So this is connected to a cable uh, in the, uh, the greenhouse or in the high tunnel. And uh, you have a single stem, that's our aim uh, with melons, we trellis a single stem up uh, to the top uh, of the trellis system and then manipulate the, the laterals um, coming out of it. So this is just a side view of that trellis. Here you can see it's a, the difference between having it horizontally and having it upright. So you can clearly see it's a lot easier to manage, uh, but trellising this crop vertically uh, has a big labor input and that, that uh, is a concern uh, when you grow this crop uh, in this manner. So what do we do uh, to get the crop up uh, to, the, the, to the top of the trailer system? So first of all, the bottom of the plant, we clear all lateral shoots. This is what I call a, a lateral shoot. Um, they come out of the nodes on the plant we clear the bottom 18 inches of the plant uh, of all lateral shoots. Um, in the meantime, we have the, the main stem uh, growing up. Um, it grows very rapidly, about a foot uh, per day or every second day, uh, depending on conditions. Uh, it grows super fast in those first few weeks until it actually starts to uh, set and, and, and grow uh, the fruit itself. Um, so, one thing that I do have to tell you is that uh, this crop is very susceptible to uh, bacterial wilt. And uh, we have cucumber beetles here in the state that uh, transmits uh, this uh, bacterial disease. And uh, so if you prune the plant uh, and if you wanna use pruners, you have to sterilize the pruners between uh, the different plants. Otherwise, just use your hands to, uh, to get the, the laterals off. Um, so yeah, moving up on the plant, uh, and as we see fruit set happening uh, on the laterals, and uh, I have to tell you this, that uh, the female flowers are all on the lateral uh, uh, shoots. So nothing on the main stem. So don't just prune all those laterals out because that's where the, the money is gonna be. And we wait until we see that that fruit is uh, set, and then they will decide as to how to prune it in the end. Usually. I leave one lateral with the fruit set, it will clean out the next one and leave another one. Um, so alternating it, but it's hard to get more than four, even five fruit on a plant, but that's the aim. Um, we, are, we haven't had really higher yields uh, than that on the, on the plant. Um, at the top, we terminate uh, the, the main uh, shoot uh, when it reaches the top of the, the trailer system. And um, yeah, by trellising this, we, we also make it easier for the bomb bees to get in there and, and get the pollen delivered to the plant. So, so to show you, there's the plant support clips that we use to clip it uh, onto this uh, trellis string. It guides the plant up. Uh, that's the node. 
this is where the uh, the side shoot or the lateral comes out. Um, that's the closer view. That is the the uh, premature or immature fruit there. The flower hasn't opened yet. Um, that's where we uh, cut the uh, the lateral off. About one, uh, you can even leave two leaves um, after the fruit uh, to help gets uh, photosynthesis to the fruit itself. Okay, so now I'm handing over to Wen Jing. She's gonna talk about uh, cucumber production. Um, so cucumber and melons are in the same family. Both are wine crops, um, similar to what Patrice has mentioned for growing melons. You can grow cucumbers um, either in a single tree system. Um, Patrice, please move the slides. Okay. So you can grow cucumbers either in a single string system as shown in this left picture, or on a netting system as shown in the right picture. Okay, next. And there are a few things you may consider in choosing a, a trellis system that work best for a situation. Uh, for cucumbers, one of the considerations is the type of cucumber you are growing. So why is this important? Um, see these two pictures. Um, this, what on these two pictures, two different types of cucumbers, but they are growing on the same stream um, trellis system. Like they are growing in the same way, but they are two different types of cucumbers. On the left, the cucumber can develop fruit on every single node of the mainstream. But this is different than melons, what Patrick just mentioned. Patrick said the melons, they have fruit developed on the lateral shoot. But for the cucumbers, especially this genetic type of cucumbers, they have fruit on every single node of the mainstream. Um, on the right, this plant does not develop fruit on every single node um, of the stream. Um, while a fruit might develop on lateral shoots at where, where the blue arrow Put, I put the blue arrow that you didn't see a cucumber fruit on the mainstream, but um, this but cucumbers might develop on the lateral shoot if I left the lateral shoots unpruned. So in this case, I pruned the lateral shoot, but there might be a cucumber there if I didn't prune this shoot, uh, didn't prune those stackers. So, so that's a point I think everyone should realize is that pruning those uh, suckers, the lateral shoots, um, would sacrifice yield, especially for the type of cucumbers on this right. Um, so the, those cucumbers not develop fruit at a single node. But, but why we still, although we know it might sacrifice yield, why we still do that? Why we still using those string trellis to do the cucumber trellis? Well, there are many benefits, as Patrice mentioned in the earlier slides, of why we do so much of the pruning. Uh, when it comes to cucumbers specifically, uh, string trellis and the prune of those lateral shoots, it support a much longer harvest season compared to growing cucumbers on a netting system. Um, this is easier for pest control, um, much better um, coverage when you spray pesticides. Um, if there's less foliage. Um, and also you could get a higher harvest efficiency. And this is a little different than melons, like you only harvest, like Patrick said, like four fruit from its plant, but cucumbers, you will harvest a lot of fruit from its plant. So have this low, um, less foliage is have a higher harvest efficiency. You can easily to see the fruit. Um, in this picture, the cucumbers are grown on a, on a string trellis all the lateral shoots are removed. After the main stem reached the top, it was turned down and grown downward. In greenhouse hydroponic production, the plant may be topped and then allowed two shoots to go downward. Um, next slide. Alternatively, it's okay to prune all the leaves on the main stem of a cucumber plant after the fruit are harvested, like showing you those pictures. A general rule of thumb is to leave at least 12 to 15 leaves with, um, and this way you won't really sacrifice photosynthesis and reduce yield. But you don't want to remove more leaves than that. Um, so if all the leaves are removed, it is easier to make the main stem circle on the ground as shown in the picture. So you can constantly harvest this plant. 
The drawback of this system, of course, as you can imagine, is the labor, very high labor involved. Here's a high tide cucumber production guide. It has detailed description of for pruning and trellising, as well as many other information in growing cucumbers in high tide loads. Um, you can download it for free from the internet. Hi, uh, I'm Liz Maynard. I think I was going to continue on with uh, tomato production. This is a, a system actually in a, a greenhouse, I think. But if we move on to the next slide, you'll see um, some systems, uh, photos of uh, uh, tomatoes in high tunnels in Indiana. And you notice that many people are using the stake and weave system that you may be familiar with uh, in field production. But there, uh, I've also seen people using uh, um, cages of, of different types, uh, and this is this is not uncommon for uh, semi-determinate varieties that are uh, commonly grown, and sometimes also for indeterminate varieties. For indeterminate varieties, if we go to the next slide, um, we do also see people using what you might see in a high wire greenhouse system, where the tomato is pruned to either one or two stems. And then each stem is attached to a string with the clips like what we saw in the uh, in use both in the melon and the, and the cucumbers. Or with tomatoes, you can also just wind this uh, stem around the string as the plant grows. And then the string is either attached to part of the structure if it's strong enough or to a wire or other support that's uh, put in the structure. Um, and I think we can go into the, the next slide. If you're in a, a longer growing system, you might come to the point where your tomato has reached the top of the structure or you know the top of the string. In that case, um, you might wanna lower it down. So there are the tomahooks uh, like you see on the top left picture or the roller hooks on the right that make it easy to kind of lower the string as the plant grows. And then the tomato vines can be um, uh, uh, run along the ground and uh, the growing part of the tomato uh, remains upright. And the picture on the right shows a system where uh, tomatoes were uh, are going to have two stems and the strings are kind of in a V, one string supporting each stem in a kind of a slant formation. Um, I want to go on to talk uh, just a little bit about tomato plant anatomy and, and pruning tomatoes. Uh, tomato has um, main stem, leaves, uh, uh, branches, and flower clusters. All of those can be pruned. We'll be talking mostly about pruning the branches or the suckers today. I think you can go on to the next uh, slide and go ahead and, and uh, cl yeah, click. So that big thing on the bottom lower left is a leaf. And generally we only remove that uh, Sometimes in the single stem or the double stem, some leaves will be removed at the bottom of the plant after those lower clusters have formed or when you're getting ready to lower the stem. The uh, suckers or branches uh, have the opportunity to form at each node, and that's what I'll be spending most of the time uh, about today talking. In some systems, fruit are also uh, pruned, and that typically will uh, increase the size of remaining fruit on that cluster and can be helpful in certain situations, but it's a little bit more detailed than we want to get to today. Uh, and then topping the stem is another practice that's sometimes used also more detail than we can get into today. So let's go on and to the next slide and think more specifically about sucker or branch pruning. Uh, Petrus already mentioned many of the reasons you might uh, prune in uh, any crop in a high tunnel. And one of the uh, things that sometimes we see in tomatoes, not always, is an earlier harvest. Also often an increase in the average fruit size uh, in addition to some of the other benefits. The way we prune uh, suckers or branches is usually just snapping them off by hand. They'll usually break off pretty easily right close to the stem. Ideally when the suckers are small, when those branches are small, um, well, sometimes it's hard. Uh, if people are busy, they end up getting a little bit bigger. So which ones do you take off? And if we go to the next uh, slide, th that will uh, depend on the, uh, on the type of plant and the type of support system. If it's an indeterminate tomato and you're doing one stem production, 
you would remove all the sucker. So any place a leaf joins the main stem, you would take that little branch out, you know, as soon as it's a few inches, inches long. If you're going to a two stem production system, you would look on that main stem and see where the first flower cluster on the main stem is here. Yeah, and Petrus is pointing it out there. And then leave the sucker just below that. See that one is just below the first main stem flower cluster. Sometimes people call that where there's a strong Y because that sucker is gonna grow into a big thick branch. So if you're going to a two stem production system, you leave that and you leave the main stem, which on this plant is kind of leaning over to the left, and then remove all the others. You remove the ones below it, and as the plant grows, you go in and you pinch off those suckers during the production system. There are other options, even with indeterminate tomatoes, you don't have to prune, but those are probably the most common ones if you're using a uh, system where you're supporting one or two stems. Let's move to the next slide. For the semi-determinate or determinate tomatoes, uh, you may not need to prune, if, if, but if you are supporting them in a trellis weave, weave system, sometimes people uh, uh, choose to prune. And if they do, usually they are not pruned above the first flower cluster, but only below the first flower cluster. And the degree of pruning depends on the variety and how vigorous it is and how people want to management. So again, similar to the... Um, indeterminate varieties, they, the kind of the identifying point is that first flower cluster on the main stem. And I think in the upper picture, you can almost, you can see it pretty readily. And you can see on that plant, there's one branch left below the first flower cluster. And I think in fact, there are two more below the first flower cluster. And that would be considered a moderate, a moderate pruning. You're leaving two or three suckers. A light pruning, you might just only remove the suckers down near the ground and a heavy pruning, you would just leave one or maybe no suckers. So, and, and those choices would be based on the, uh, the uh, vigor of the plant and the, um, you know, kind of your desire for the production system. Let's move on to the next uh, slide. In high tunnels, um, we looked at, uh, this was work we did up at uh, Penny Purdue Research Farm a, a few years ago. We wanted to, I wanted to compare like a, stake and weave system with no pruning versus a uh, trellis system where plants were pruned to two main stems um, if they were indeterminate plants or in the case of mountain fresh which is a uh, semi-determinate plant we uh, we uh, pruned up to that first uh, we left the first branch below the first flower cluster and then all the other ones above the first flower cluster. So we had three varieties, Mountain Fresh, Cherokee Purple and Big Beef. And we did this two years and two high tunnels uh, each year. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Just a, a quick picture of what the structures um, looked like. And I wanted to mention that we planted perhaps a little later than many of you may be doing in your high tunnels. The first year we planted at the end of May, the second year we planted at the end of April and then we harvested in uh, basically August through middle of September. Uh, and this is what things look like. This is a mountain fresh. If you're, it's a, it's a vigorous semi-determinate variety. On the right is the stake and weave, and on the left is the ones where we pruned up to that first uh, big branch and then just left all the other things grow and supported about four branches with strings. And the next is a Cherokee purple an heirloom variety on the left is a stake and weave and on the right is where we prune to two main stems. And the next is big beef. Uh, on the left is a stake and weave with no pruning and on the right is where we prune to two uh, main stems per plant. And we looked at a uh, marketable yield. The top graph here is showing marketable number one and number two leaves through uh, kind of the middle of September. And we found that the stake and weave, which is the light yellow bars, we got higher yield in those, especially with the indeterminate varieties, big beef and Cherokee purple. You'll remember that with the mountain fresh, we actually didn't prune as much. We left, there were a lot more branches left on that. But the lower graph just shows where we included some of what we called farmer's market grade. And uh, so ones that weren't quite as high, uh, absolutely. Uh, didn't meet a number two grade, but even with that, we found a little uh, higher yield in the stake and weave uh, systems. Um, 
And let's see, uh, I want to say there were, I don't have a graph for it, but this, the uh, string system, we did have larger fruit size in the string system. And there was a suggestion that there might be potential for a larger, higher early yield with the string system. But um, we had, uh, we didn't see a significant increase early yield in the string system for when we did the trials. So I'd like to pass it over to Wenjing, who's got more uh, examples of uh, yeah. support for tomatoes. Yeah. Okay. I will follow this talk about a tomato study we did a few years ago. And in, in this study, we we'll compared three trellis systems in growing an uh, indeterminate tomato. The three systems are um, stick and wave, as Liz mentioned. Some people call it the Florida wave system. I believe most folks are familiar with it. And the next one, I call it a Spanish wave. So the key difference of stake and wave and Spanish wave is that Spanish wave system require two tomato sticks at each end. And the way we tie the plants is basically give the plants more space to grow. It is a more open structure as compared to Florida wave. So here's a link to an article at Vegetable Crop Hub newsletter. If you are interested to learn exactly how we did this, there's a step-by-step -step, um, instruction of how we did this Spanish wave system. Okay, and the search system we compared in this study is the two-liter system, as Liz described earlier. Um, next slide. Um, PHN589 is the variety used in this study. It's a, a semi-terminal semi tomato. We looked at yield of grafted and non-grafted BHM 589 growing on each of the three systems. Here's the results. For long-grafted plants, there was no yield difference among three trellis systems. But for grafted plants, Spanish wave had the highest yield. And the two liters system and Florida wave, and, and then after that two liter system, Florida wave had the lowest yield. So if you are growing grafted tomatoes, you may be familiar with that the grafted plants typically are more vigorous compared to long grafted plants. And to maximize the yield potential of the grafted plants, it looks like from our study, Spanish wave or similar trellis systems that give plants more space to grow might work better for the grafted plants um, than typical uh, stake and wave system. I think that is a take home message from this study. Okay, next slide. Patrice, you want to have a summary? Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, this is our last slide of this presentation. Um, I think it's good to ask uh, a couple of questions or a few questions before you think about uh, doing uh, a trellising uh, in, a, in a high tunnel. Um, number one, as I said, uh, way at the beginning, you have to uh, know that your structure is strong enough to handle um, the, the crop load, especially with tomatoes. Um, if you talk about 20 uh, pounds on a plant and you uh, put about 300, 400 plants in the tunnel, I mean, that's uh, quite a huge uh, uh, weight that the, 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 the crop is gonna put on the, or a pull that the crop is gonna put on the, the structure. So make sure from your uh, supplier that the structure is uh, strong enough, otherwise you have to put in uh, a separate uh, uh, trailer system, maybe using posts and uh, uh, wire and that kind of uh, stuff. So. Um, select a support system that is uh, based for your production space. Uh, if pruning is involved, like you've seen a couple of ex examples now where we uh, showed you that excessive pruning is not always um, the case. Uh, know what your pruning objectives are. Do you want to manipulate, for instance, fruit size? We couldn't really get into that uh, with this uh, time that we had this afternoon. Um, uh, do you want to uh, influence quality? How many leaves are you taking out? Are you going to cause sunburn on the, the fruit? Um, uh, is it easier to, to manage the crop? Is it easier to do scouting uh, to get your pesticide application to, to reach the, uh, the pest or disease 
uh, if it's a contact uh, 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 pesticide that you are using. Um, some other things include, you know, uh, about the activity and the, uh, the cost involved in pruning and trellising. Labor is obviously the number one thing. It takes a lot of effort to, to get the, the crop up uh, from the ground. Um, it's easier with some crops, uh, tomatoes, for instance, you can probably trellis and prune once a week with cucumber and uh, melons. You're not gonna get away with that. You probably have to do two, three times a week. Um, it's, it's a matter of what is your availability uh, on the farm um, during the growing season. Know the biology of your crop, how vigorous it is, um, what is the actual cost of your, uh, your trellis system that you wanna put in, um, how, the, how long do you intend to grow the crop? Obviously like with tomato, if you grow it uh, for nine months versus six months, the, the return on that investment will most likely be a little bit higher. But then again, you, you have more labor involved in, uh, in that. So um, will uh, pruning and tracing significantly change your, your airflow or the ease of application of pesticides or will it make harvesting easier? I think those are some of the relevant questions. Um, Wenjing and Liz, are there any last things you wanna add? Um, I think it's good. 